Hello and welcome to this very special video on my channel. Last night, the Wig Athletic Mental Health Supports Group hosted their first ever virtual night in with former Wig Athletic manager Gary Caldwell. Gary Caldwell spent a total of six years at the club and scored some very famous goals for the Latics, including a winner at Anfield and against our local rivals, Bolton Wanderers, in a 2-1 win at the University of Bolton Stadium. Gary was also involved in that special side that won the 2013 FA Cup against all odds. Gary kindly answered questions asked by the Latix fans and his stories about his favourite memories of the club were absolutely fascinating. I really hope you enjoy this Q&A, it was a fantastic night and a great way to encourage people to talk and open up about their mental health. This will hopefully be the first of many virtual nights in with the group. It's so important to talk about mental health and it's so important to reach out if you need support and uh, we are here to support anyone who would be willing to talk about their mental health because it's so important that we break the stigma. So without further ado, here is the virtual night in with Gary Caldwell by the Wig Athletic Supporters Mental Health Group. Gary, first and foremost, what have you been up to over the last uh, couple of months uh, in lockdown? Well, th thanks for inviting me on. Uh, I've actually been this lockdown, my first lockdown, I had a, a bad lockdown, shall we say. In summertime, I ended up drinking out the back every afternoon and it became <laughs> like a a very long summer holiday. <laughs> uh, so when, when we went back into lockdown, I said to myself, I need to kind of set a structure, set some goals so that uh, I kind of come out of lockdown uh, in better shape than I went into it. So I've been doing a lot of walking, uh, a bit of running, try to keep myself fitter. I've had no alcohol all in November, which is quite an achievement considering my first lockdown. Uh, and, and just trying to be generally healthier uh, in preparation for Christmas. And, and I think actually I, I feel the benefits already in terms of my mental health and, and how I feel because of the approach I've took to, to this lockdown. So I, I think it's vital that, that everyone tries as much as they can to, to look after themselves physically, which helps mentally. For people, obviously, involved in the group, mental health is a big thing. It, it's huge to, to open up and it's it's been great to see so many people open up. And uh, sorry about that uh, background noise. Um, but as a footballer and a football manager, how important is mental health to the players, to the staff, to the management when, when you're playing? Because obviously you'll have outside influences as well as internal influences with the social media and things like that. I think it's vital and I think only now is it starting to become uh, kind of in the news. I, I, I think back to my career and what you said earlier about man up and grow up here. I think that was, you know, the the only reaction you would have got back when I played if, if you said you had a problem with your mental health, which is wrong, 100% uh, wrong in, in any era. But I think nowadays it's becoming more and more apparent that, that people need help and there's no there should be no stigma attached to that everyone needs help at different times everyone goes through difficult circumstances and different challenges within their, their life uh, and it's important that when you have those moments you, you get help from whoever that may be people you can trust within your own family or whether you need to speak to people as well but uh, I think in these times with the Obviously, the, the pandemic that's, that's been going on longer than everyone would have thought. Uh, like I said, I think physically uh, trying to stay in a it's it's really and interesting and a great way to say as well that like if you are struggling to go seek help and is that why you're so involved to uh, get involved tonight and, and kind of jumped at the chance to, to speak to some of the fans. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and I think everyone, you know, these, these Zoom calls, I've, I've been on lots of them from the first lockdown and this one. I think everyone is, you know, starting to reach out and, and connect in different ways. And I think it's good that whilst at this moment in time, we're not leaving the house to socialise as much as we, we normally would to try and do something like this uh, and interact with people is, is vitally important. It gives you something for me it was something to look forward to today at 7 30 i had you know something in my diary that that i would look forward to and interact with with wigan supporters which is always uh, something I, i've enjoyed over the years uh, and i think that's important for everyone 
Absolutely, and it's, it's probably great for the Wigan fans to see you tonight. And I think there is quite a big elephant in the room. Earlier today, John Sheridan stepped down from his post as Wigan Athletic Manager to join Swindon Town. It's a question probably people tuning in for. Would you fancy that role or yeah, would you be willing to come back? Look, I, I think ever since the club went into administration, I think there's been so much support from, from everyone that, that it's been connected with Wigan at some point. I have had that my longest association with, with any club was with, with Wigan Athletic, and it is special to me, to, to my kids, uh, to my family, that, that the club means something because I was there that long. So I want to help Wigan in any way, shape or form uh, that I can, as does Graham Barrow, who, who I speak to regularly as well. He's of the same kind of feeling as myself to, towards the football club. So uh, the club know you know, where I am, I, I want to help in any way possible. Uh, and if that means me coming back and, and coaching or, or doing whatever it is, whatever it takes to, to help the football club at this time, then then I'm willing to do that. That's a great answer. And when you hear the club with Athletic, the name being mentioned, what does it mean to you? Because I'm sure it'll mean so much to so many different people and for many reasons. To me, I think... It, it's a, it's a club that you know everyone looks on Wigan Athletic as a as a small club as as a club with with no supporters and until you get inside that football club until you get the feeling of those supporters and and what the club means to the town then then you don't know about the football club and I, like I said I was lucky to to spend the longest period of my life at, at the club both playing, some coaching in the academy, then then fortunate to manage the club uh, through many highs and lows uh, in, in that period. And, and always throughout that period, the Wigan supporters were there. Uh, they were there to support you when, when times were tough, which was, was quite often the case in the Premier League, some of the lows that we had. But we, we always had a great ability as a, as a club, as a town, to to keep believing and, and, you know, keep coming back and defying the odds. Uh, and, and at this moment in time, I think the club more than ever needs to defy the odds because of the, the situation it finds himself in through no fault of anyone, you know, at the football club, no fault of the supporters, the players, the staff. Uh, they're in this situation and, and I'm sure they'll, they'll find a way out of it. It's a great message and I like how you mentioned that to oh. believe and we defy the odds because during your time as a player, you pulled off some of the greatest escapes in Premier League history. I mean, the season where we beat Manchester City, Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, it's beyond dreams really and, and you was a part of that. And I think you won player of the season that year too. Yeah, I, I don't know why we always left it so late. I think it would be far easier to have a good start to the season and get to 40 points before Christmas. But we had a great ability to, a bit like Scotland last night, to, to keep supporters on the edge of their seat and uh, make you travel all the way to Stoke and bite your fingernails till 15 minutes to go. Uh, and Roddy Yeager scored that header. Uh, and that day, actually, I always remember looking over to Roberto and it was classic uh, Roberto that day. With 20, 25 minutes to go, I was kind of trying to get a feel for the other games because I think about six teams could go down. And he was standing at the side of the, the pitch with his brown shoes, looking cool as ever, and just gave me the thumbs up. And I thought, this is, you know, we, we are miles away from this. There's no chance of us getting relegated. And only later to watch match of the day and realise at that point we were actually getting relegated. And the manager had that you know, aura and calmness about him that, that filtered onto the pitch and allowed us to play the, the football that we played and play with the confidence that, that we played with and managed to score that. It was actually a brilliant goal that day, considering the pressure we were under, the way we passed through Ben Watson through midfield, out to Maynor and, and cross for, for Hugo. Uh, just summed up how, how good Roberto and how calm Roberto was and, and how good a team that was and Fantastic celebrations behind the goal, but so many memories. I think Arsenal, when when Charles scored, when we scored the three late goals to, oh, to beat Oxford yeah. Man City in the FA Cup in the last minute, it's it's a club that that always defies the odds. And like I said, now more than ever, it needs to do that. 
some really great memories there, which the fans will be really fond of. I remember the Stoke game. Everyone was biting their nails, feeling sick in that away end, and obviously defied the odds once again. So thanks so much, Raymond, for listening. Uh, now it's your turn to ask a question to Gary. Gary, are you ready to take on some of the fan questions? I think so. You think so? Not very confident, but I'm sure you'll be okay. So what I'll do is I'll go through uh, in order of the people I see on my screen. If you don't want to ask a question, uh, don't feel like you have to, uh, you can pass. But I want to give everyone a fair opportunity to ask uh, something to Gary Cordell. So we'll start off with uh, the taxi man himself, Stephen Foster. Stephen, have you got any questions for Gary Cordell? here. Phil, have you got any questions for Gary Cordell? I know Stephen's uh, busy at work. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, Gary. How are you, mate? Um, yeah, um, I was just wondering, how is the old shoulder that you had the operation with? My, my hips. thought it was your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perhaps. I, I wish it was my shoulder. <laughs> uh, I thought you'd had a little bit shaved off the um, off the bone. Yeah, it was my my hips that I had that. Was the hip, uh, right. Yeah, and that was that, that was the main injury that, that stopped me playing uh, yeah. so young. And I actually had uh, a double re hip replacement uh, when I was about. 35, I think, about three, three, three and a half year ago now. Uh, I had a double hip replacement just to help with my with my everyday life. And uh, right. it's been massive, actually, how much it's helped in terms of my everyday life with the kids and stuff and playing golf and, and being able to exercise. It's, it's been massive. But uh, it was, they were pretty pretty bad by, by the end of my career, which, like I said, was ultimately what finished my career in the end. It's a, a really nice question for you to ask, Phil. And I'd also like to say, too, uh, for anyone who doesn't want to speak in and ask a question, you can send a message into the chat, like Thomas Smart has done. Uh, Thomas Smart asked, who is the best player you played with? Best player I've played with? Uh, I think I'd, I'd say Sean Maloney. Uh, he's somebody I... Uh, I played with at, at many different levels of, of both our careers. I first played with them for Scotland under 21s. Uh, and it's funny, we actually didn't really get on. I'm not saying we didn't get on, but we, we didn't really strike up a, a relationship when we were playing for Scotland 21s. We were, we were teammates, but we weren't friends uh, out with football. Uh, then when I first went to Celtic, uh, I played with him there and, and again teammates and then when he came back to Celtic that was when we kind of struck up a friendship when we were both in our kind of mid-20s and then obviously he came to Wigan throughout our Scotland career we, we played together and he's somebody I still keep in touch with regular now he was a a fantastic professional uh, he was he was obsessed with training obsessed with fitness uh, and practicing his free kicks and different things and uh, was a top player and I think actually Wigan fans are lucky because I think his best period as a football player for me was, was at Wigan Athletic uh, some of his performances uh, I think he liked the free kicks that he scored away at Arsenal uh, QPR his goal against Man United at, at the DW uh, a, a fantastic player and I'm sure you all enjoyed enjoyed watching him he was an outstanding player, and I know, obviously, you know him well from your time at Celtic. Daniel Dickinson asked, who was the most difficult player to play against? Uh, I've, I've been asked this question a lot in my life, and, and I give two answers. Uh, the, the easy answer is, is Messi. Uh, I played against him for Celtic, and he was just incredible, but everyone kind of thinks that's me just name dropping but he was very good but the, the real answer is a guy called Steve Torpy I don't know if any of you know Steve Torpy he used to play for Scunthorpe uh, and when I was at Newcastle I went on loan to Darlington and, and the, it was the old third division then but what is equivalent of League 2 now and in my third game I came up against Steve Torpy and I'll never forget the look in his eye when he's seen a young 18-year-old centre-back 
who had never played or played two league games uh, in his career. And he just kept telling the centre half to hang it above me. And he just kept coming in and hitting me with elbows and knees. And he just totally dominated me and bullied me the whole game. And it was a massive learning experience for me because in academy football, I'd never came up against a striker of that physical size of that aggression with, with that experience and, and I genuinely didn't know how to handle them so that was the it was probably the one and only time in a football park where I felt like I was I was powerless uh, and didn't know what to do to, to stop the player I say when I played Messi I, I, I knew what to do to stop him I, ju I just couldn't because he was that good so uh, that's why I say both the players Two great shouts. Obviously, Messi is uh, well-known uh, across the world, one of the best players to ever lived. And the next question is from Sam Rennington, and he said, what was your best memory at Wigan, and how did it feel to win the FA Cup in 2013? My best memory? So many. I, I think, from a club point of view, Wembley, the FA Cup final, was... Was, was incredible uh, to see so many fans behind the goal, uh, to, to kind of, the, the performance that we, we, we put on that day was, was incredible against a really top team, full, fully world-class players, uh, and, and to win the FA Cup and walk up the stairs and uh, lift that trophy was, was, was incredible for, for the whole football club. From a Individual uh, memory, I would say Anfield was was my kind of my, my favourite memory. P again, playing against the top team, I'd never won at Anfield before as a football club, and uh, to manage to score the goal and and in the changing rooms after we had a brilliant night out in Manchester. Mike Pollock was was in his usual good form, uh, so it was a, a fantastic day and and late night, shall we say, all round. I'm sure any night out with Mike Pollock would be quite entertaining. And the next question <laughs> is from Ian Trencher. And he said, who do you feel was your best signing as the Wigan Athletic Manager? Wow. I've never been asked that before, but that is a good question. Uh, I'm going to say two players here as well, if, if that's okay. I'd say the, my best signing was Dave Perkins. For He was the first signing. He got a lot of criticism for for us for it being our first signing, and he was a, a huge influence on the the dressing room, on the pitch, on the, on the club. Uh, just his enthusiasm for football uh, was was amazing. So I'd say, in terms of he was a free, he was about I don't know thirty. He was the same age as me actually at the time, thirty two, thirty three, I think at the time. Uh, and I think for what he gave the club. Uh, he was a he was a brilliant signing, and I'd, I'd say the other one from kind of club and financial reasons would have been Dan Burn. Uh, he was somebody that w we got for nothing he, again on a, on a free from from Fulham. Uh, Malcolm Crosby, the the chief scout at the time, w was in fairness to him was adamant. You know, he was he was a no brainer. Uh, we looked at him and, and we felt like, you know, he was going to be a good signing. I always tell him he had a disastrous start and he was part of the reason that was why I lost my job. But <laughs> uh, I think in the long term, he, he showed, you know, how good a player he is. And he's, he's playing in the Premier League now. And we took him at a time when nobody else really wanted him. So, and the club made a lot of money as well uh, from him. So I'd say both of them were, were great signings. But I must say, I think back to, to all the players we signed uh, in that period, you know, Max Power, Will Gregg, Michael Jacobs, Yannick Wiltshire, uh, Sam Morsey. We, and, and, and I say we because Malcolm Crosby and Graham Barrow had a, a huge influence on recruitment. I, I lent on both of them a lot in terms of their experience and their knowledge of players and their eye for a player was, was incredible. Ultimately, myself and David have the final say and, and try to bring them to the club. But both of them, uh, in terms of uh, the, their ability to spot the talent and, and, bring, and bring that to me was, was, was a team effort and our recruitment was very good. 
it was an outstanding swan for League One. And I'd also like to say to anyone who's in the uh, the group at the moment, in the group meeting, if you've got any questions, if you can type it in through the chat and we'll uh, we'll go through the questions like that. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Uh, Gary's did some excellent answers so far and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more. So the next question is from uh, James and he said, have you adjusted your management style or style of play since you last managed Wigan? Yeah, I think I have. I think in everything in life, you have to evolve, you have to, you know, adapt, you have to be flexible. Uh, do I still have the same core beliefs of, of how I think football should be played, how I think, you know, the, the culture and the, the, that I want to create in, in a football club is still pretty much the same. But without a doubt, I think the, the, the next two jobs I went to were, were very challenging. Uh, on so many different levels and, and because of that you, you have to evolve, you have to adapt. Uh, uh, some of actually my, my, my kind of most memorable or some of the games I'm most proud of were at those other clubs because the lack of resources that I had and, and we, we drew nil now with Chesterfield away at Bolton team that, that won the, the league uh, and, and had to set up tactically to be hard to beat and uh, we, we went to Sheffield United that year and, and lost 3-2 with 10 men, which, which cost us the, the game, really, or I think we'd have got a point. So, uh, you know, having to be flexible, having to adapt, I, I learned more in, in those two jobs because, like we just spoke about, the players I had at Wigan were superb. They, they were really top players, top professionals, and they made my life much easier. It's, it's a great and really interesting answer. And to link on to uh, management, Paul Roach, who is actually the manager of a local Sunday League side, Wigan Wolves, he said, which players have you played alongside uh, Thinks uh, you, you think could be a manager? Uh, I think Sean Maloney uh, will, will go on to, to be a manager. He's obviously working with Roberto at Belgium and, and getting fantastic experience there, but I think he has the, the football brain uh, for that. Uh, who else at Wigan? It's hard. I, I think there's, uh, for management, it takes all sorts. I think it's, there's no one size fits all. Uh, for management, it takes different characters. It takes different styles. Uh, so, so I think, you know, sometimes you, you, you see players uh, that, that you think, yeah, they'll definitely go on to, to become a manager. And other times it can be obscure players who you don't think really, you know, love football that much. Because to, to go on to be a manager, you definitely need to love football. You definitely need to, you know, have a real passion for it and, and want to, to watch games and, and think about the game 24-7 because the, the job consumes you when you're in it. So, uh Sean is the only one I can think of off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be others. I've always felt like Sam Morsey could go on to management after his career, career finishes. He's an excellent yeah. leader, and I think he could be a good shout. And a question to you now is uh, more Scotland-related, uh, because the person asking is Scottish. This is a question from Gail, and she said, how did he feel last night when uh, David Marshall uh, was setting himself up for the final penalty? I watched it with... My younger son, Jaden, who pre-game wanted an England strip. He was born in England. My oldest son was born in Scotland. And then Jaden was born just as I actually came uh, to Wigan in 2010. He was born in the February. And he wanted an England strip for his Christmas. And thankfully, we, we won the penalty kicks because after it, he now says he wants a Scotland one but because they're going to go to the Euros. So uh, hopefully, I've finally got him off that, that England uh kind of want to be an England supporter. Uh, but I watched the game. I thought we were brilliant in the game. Felt very comfortable. Jaden was more nervous than I was because I, I, I felt like they were in total control of the game. Then when the goal went in in the 90th minute, it was classic Scotland. And then extra time was a bit edgy, uh, but got through that. And then the penalties were just nerve-wracking everyone. And the players was superb. That's 10 penalties in, in two games that they've scored, which they deserve a lot of credit for. And and Marshy is someone I've known for a long time, played under 21 Scotland with him and delighted to see him, you know, come up the hero because he's he's actually played in an era with really good goalies 
for Scotland. Alan McGregor and Craig Gordon have the three of them have always been competing and, and one has been in at different times. And, and for Marsha to get that moment and, and make the save, um, delighted for him, he deserved it. Yeah, Craig, you were saying something. Sorry about that. It was, a, it was a great achievement and a massive result for the entire nation. First major tournament since 1998. And uh, the next question is from our ambassador, Adam Brooks. And he said, can you tell us a little bit more about what happened before the FA Cup with the game plan, how the team prepared and uh, obviously the mindset going into it? Uh, the game plan, we actually played City, if you remember, we played them in the league at the Etihad about, I don't know, three, four weeks before maybe. And we, it was, it was, Roberto was at his best when he was preparing a game plan for a big game against a team that that was expected to beat us because he didn't do the norm of sitting in, being defensive and, and hitting on the counter-attack. He always had a, another thought in terms of attacking the opposition and how he'd hurt them. So we played the 3-4-1-2 with Sean Maloney as number 10, Callum and, and Aruna Kone as, as wide forwards, so not your normal kind of two forwards playing narrow, we played them as wide forwards. So Callum was in his natural right wing position. Aruna, whilst not naturally a left-sided player, he had that mobility that he could play up and down that side. But what he did that night was, I think he was almost preempting the cup final and, and preparing for that whilst we were playing that game because he said, second half, he said they'll change to a back three. And he said, when they do... Sean Maloney had to go from number 10 to left wing. Aruna Kone came in as a central striker and we would go with three up front. And I've never seen this before or, or since, but at about 55, 60 minutes, they changed to a back three and company went right centre back. And Sean went to left wing and absolutely terrorised them for, for five, 10 minutes. And very quickly, you could see uh, Mancini and, and their staff thinking, we can't leave this because he's, he's killing them. And they, they changed back to a back four, which Roberto said they would do. And as soon as they'd done that, Sean came back to number 10, Aruna. And it was just, at that point, I think he knew tactically he had them. And for the cup final, they never changed. They played the same way. They wanted the fullbacks to bomb on, which was why we played the wide forwards to, to basically force one of them back. And... Like I said, it was his, his, his thought process of that, of how to attack a team uh, that, that, was, that was going to put you under pressure and, and leave players in certain positions that, that forced them to, to attack differently. So he felt that every team City played would just sit in and defend, which allowed both fullbacks to play really high. When City played against us, they could only attack with one fullback, which took away a lot of their attacking threat. And that was the, the genius of Roberto. In terms of our, our preparation, I remember there was talk of us not getting suits and, and I was dead against that. I felt, for, for me, it was tradition for all the players. I spoke to all the players as the captain. I spoke to all the players and uh, I, I, I spoke to them and said, you know, do we want it? And, and we made a big thing, so we, we got suits. And I felt that was a big thing as well, that, we, you know, we, we savoured the whole day and the experience of an FA Cup final. And I thought they were really nice suits as well. I thought we looked smart on the day. Uh, we travelled down by train as usual. We went to the... Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was maybe... The, the, we went to the stadium in the semi-final. I can't remember if we went in the final. We might have or we might, might not on the, on the Friday just to get a feel for the place. Uh, and we watched a little FA Cup video that the, the staff had prepared to, to show us the history of the FA Cup, to show us the upsets that had been before, Wimbledon beating Liverpool and stuff like that, to give us that sense of, you know, what, what we were going into the next day and what, what we had the opportunity to achieve. And then the, the, the really good thing uh, the staff done was... We'd had a psychologist in for about two or three times in, in the lead up to that, for, for the league campaign and for the cup. And we had done a, a thing where they, they gave us a sheet of paper with every single player's name down the side and staff member down the side of the sheet of paper, then a box blank next to it. 
and it was I'm I'm proud to uh, be a teammate of this person because and then everyone had to write something in the box next to it. And after dinner on the Friday night, we all came back to our rooms and as as you went in your room, there was an envelope sitting with all the little bits of paper and you know words written by you didn't know by who but by by your teammates, which uh, was quite emotional and and, and quite a, a really good thing to do to know you know what what your teammates thought of you and and you know what we were going into the next day we needed everyone to be together and that was I, I thought that was really clever uh, and, and how we did that uh, and then the day of the game it was a it was a later kickoff it was it was a 5 30 kickoff I think for a cup final so uh, it was just kind of trying to stay calm and uh, try to pass the time as as we normally do uh, and then and then going to the game and, and and like I said I remember the day vividly the, the supporters behind the goal to to the left uh, and, and Ben Watson scoring in that goal in the 90th minute is every time I see it still the, the shivers on the back of my neck go up and uh, it's a, it was a special moment. What is the transition like from a player to a manager? How difficult is that and what changes do you need to make? Uh, it was really difficult for me in one sense and, and, and not so difficult in another. Really difficult because I think I've said this before, one day I was sitting next to Scott Carson who, who would hang my clothes up every day and take the mickey out of my gear and, and the next day I was his manager so I was sitting, <laughs> sitting in the, change, the, the staff changing room and that was a bit uh, surreal and a bit strange and, and not just Scott but all, all, most of the players, you know, they were my mates and now I was their manager, so that was difficult, and if anything I think those games near the end of that season the players almost tried too much, because I was their teammate and, and they wanted it to work and they wanted uh, to do well for me, that, that they tried too hard, and, and I think the best thing that could have happened was, you know, most of the players left, I think there was only, there would have been Chris McCann uh, Lee Nicholson, uh, Leon Barnett. I think that's probably it from from the team the previous season uh, that, that stayed uh, for for the next season. So I was fortunate that most of the players wanted to go, uh, and they all left and and allowed uh, myself and Graham to to assemble a, a new squad uh, and and challenge for the. The, the League One, uh, but I think the easier part of it, which I've found now having gone to different clubs, was I understood the football club. So when I got the job, although my teammates, you know, I was now their manager, I understood the football club from top to bottom. I'd been there for about four and a half years, I think it was, as a player. So I, I knew, you know, everyone at the football club, uh, the fans knew me and, and kind of my approach to football and what type of character I was and I think that made it a lot easier having been to different clubs it's hard to to build that relationship with supporters with the, with the new club with the players whilst trying to win football matches because every time you win or lose a match there's an emotional reaction to that and and you can't build that relationship because you're you're kind of on the roller coaster so to speak and, and winning and losing games so uh, that definitely helped knowing, knowing the club, uh, getting the job and uh, knowing the club helped. A, a question which will follow on quite nicely to that is from uh, Conor Donnelly. He's a, a massive fan based in Ireland and he'd like to ask, what was it like to work alongside uh, David Sharp? It was brilliant. I, I think I'd, I'd known him a little bit. He, 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 he was starting to come into the club more as I was a player, uh, so got to know him a little bit. Uh, but we had, for me, we had the, the best, again, my other clubs, comparing them, I had the best relationship with him. We spoke every single day. We probably met at least four or five times a week. Uh, and, and we talked about Wigan. We talked about the, the team. We talked about, you know, how we can improve how we can be successful and we basically 24 seven, we were doing everything we can to, to make the club successful. And I had a fantastic relationship with him, still have a very good relationship with him, even although 
he, he obviously sacked me, and I think that shows, uh, you know, even after that, we, we still have a strong relationship because of the, the time we spent together and, and what we did uh, for the club can, can never be taken away. Following from that question, do you think that you deserved a bit more time before you were uh, sacked from the club? I think every manager thinks they, de- yeah, <laughs> they deserve more. definitely. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, but uh, the next yeah, question... No- the next question is is uh, from someone I know quite well. He's a he's a very promising coach. He coaches the Chorley under sixteens, and at the moment the the Chorley under sixteens have a bit of a habit of losing concentration and uh, dropping the heads when things are going wrong. Have you got any advice to help improve mental resilience on overall player psychology? I think I was actually discussing with a friend of mine today about. Uh, I, I think the next. The uh, big thing in football is going to be the the psych, social element of coaching and the psychological element of, of football players. I think probably about 15, 15, 20 years ago now, there was a big sports science boom where, you know, physical training, strength and conditioning, uh, recovery, uh, injury prevention started to come into football. I think the next big change in football will be the psychological uh, approach to developing players, to helping players with their mental resilience. I I was big in it. I brought Lee Richardson into the club uh, when I was uh, at Wigan back in. We brought him in in probably around September, October time. And Lee was fantastic with the players, with the staff. And he gave us that understanding of psychology and how you deal with people and how everybody's different. I think every, you know, whilst you're a team, you have to treat everybody differently because everyone has different needs. Uh, Some people, you know, need to be kicked up the arse a a few times to to get them going and other people need an arm around them and and that will get them going. So you need to understand people uh, and how you get the best out of people. And Lee was brilliant in doing that and has went on. He, he works for Liverpool now, which shows how good he is at his job. But uh, in terms of how you develop it, I think it's a bit of the, the kind of challenge and support. You have, to, you have to know when is the right time to challenge players and, and push them that little bit and not too far that you break them, but push them over their limits and then know when the time is to, to dial that back and, and put an arm around them and support them and, and talk through whatever issues they have. But if you're too nice and, and support all the time, then they never know what that, that peak looks like. And if you keep them at that peak, then, then there's, there's an element of they can break down and they can, they can struggle. So you have to challenge and support at the right times when those times are. Is, is down to the coach and the relationship with the players and, and you have to understand the players and, and like I said, each one's different and you have to know when, when to push and, and when to support. So that would be my advice. But like I said, it's not it's, it's not like a, a medicine you can give and, and you know the exact uh, amount of medicine to give to, to, to make you better at something. It's something you have to uh, work out for yourself and use your intuition as a coach to, to help the player. I think that's a great answer and hopefully that'll help you out, Ben. And to link on to the coaching and management side, Sam Remington has asked, uh, do you have any advice for a a young person wanting to get into coaching or management? Uh, It would be get the badges, get the necessary badges, work towards them uh, and and develop your skills with with people. I think think coaching, whilst you have to have an understanding of football, you have to know... uh, obviously what you're doing in terms of that and you have to get the, the necessary badges to coach at different levels. Uh, to be a good coach, you have to understand people, you have to know how to get the best out of people uh, and you have to have you know brilliant people skills, good emotional intelligence, uh, like we were speaking about there, when to challenge, when to support players uh, and that's that's what good coaches do. The, the, the football part of it, especially at professional level, everyone's doing a similar thing. How you get the best out of certain people is, is what sets the, the top coaches apart. 
I think that's another great piece of advice. And the next question is back onto the football, back onto the pitch. And it's from Barry Goodwin. I was expecting this question, as was uh, Peter Millwood. And uh, he said, in the 2014 FA Cup semi-final against Arsenal, why was you selected to take the first penalty? That's, that's every Wigan fan's first question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we knew the outcome. And is there an inside story as to why you took the first penalty? Uh, where do I start with this? Uh, uh, so if, if I go way back, uh, when I was at Celtic, we, we played a Champions League qualifier against Sparta at Moscow uh, over two legs. Uh, they were an excellent team. They had a young uh, Pavlichenko who went on to Spurs up front. They were a really top team and we played them in Moscow first. We drew one each, came back to Celtic Park, drew one each, went to extra time, went to penalty kicks. Now this for Celtic was, you know, a huge game to, to qualify for the Champions League. It was a massive game financially, a massive game for the supporters and it went to penalties and I took the first penalty that night and scored. So, I, I, you know, I had no problems that night doing it with, with, with top players around about me, top internationals. And, and I always say, even that night, I think we had six that night, six players out of 11 put their hand up to say, I'll take a penalty. Then the manager decided, right, bang, 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 bang. Who wants to take the first one? I said, I'll take the first one. Nobody else said it. So I took the first penalty and scored. I then... Took a penalty in a League Cup semi-final for Celtic. I took the second penalty that night because Scott McDonald wanted to take the first penalty. That night, I, I really got scared because it actually we won 11-10 on penalties. And if Scott hadn't scored, I was having to take another one. So the nerves were really kind of cranking up. Normally, when you take your penalty and score, the relief is incredible. And you kind of forget about the team for a bit. And you think, oh, thank God I've done my bit. But then as I got back and the penalty started going in and, and missing at the same time, I thought it was going to come round to me again, but it didn't. So that probably paints a little bit of a picture that when it came to the FA Cup semi-final, I had no problem putting my hand up to say I'll take a penalty. I, I had done it before. The problem was four people put their hand up out of 11. So that that's a problem in itself that you need five. <laughs> so one person was then getting forced to take a penalty. They then said, Uwe said, who wants to take first? And like I'd done previous, I said, I'll take first. Nobody else said, I want to take the first one. So, so I took the first penalty. And the funny thing, I spoke to my kids about this, I spoke to other people about this. For some reason, and I, and I don't know if it was because, if you remember, I'd been out for a long time with my hip injury. And it was actually my first game back. That was the first time I'd been on the pitch since the previous season. And I don't know if I was just uh, really ecstatic to get on the pitch and just to be able to play again. And the, the kind of euphoria of that and just playing football again was such a, a good thing. But I didn't feel as nervous as I should have felt. I felt really comfortable walking to the ball. The other times I took penalties and scored, I was terrified, really, really nervous and, and felt that kind of uh, churning in your stomach, that anxiety. But for some reason that day, I felt really calm, which some people might think, well, that, that's a good thing, but it, it didn't work out that way. I, I went the same side I always go when I take a penalty and, and I didn't hit it as far in the corner or as, as clean as, as I would have liked and, and ultimately the goalie saved it and... Uh, that that is, you know, the story of of the infamous penalty semi final penalty kick, and uh, you, you want to take it back. You want to, you know, you obviously want to score, but that that's life. I, I would always be someone that would rather, you know, be there to miss than 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 not take it at all. I'd rather be that person, and and I can live with that consequence. I couldn't live with other consequence of not not going up to take it. That's a great answer. And with penalties, they are a lottery and it all depends on the day. Some of the best penalty takers in the world sometimes miss and shoots out, so it does happen. And uh, to link on now to the current squad, Stephen Foster would like to ask, you've, you've worked with a lot of the younger lads. I know Chris Merry was uh, in around the team when uh, you was the manager. How do you think uh, they've been doing so far to the season and how long do you think it'll take for the youngsters to adapt to League One level? I, I think they've been doing 
extremely well in a in a really difficult uh, situation for for the football club, obviously, but for them as well. Because ideally, you wouldn't put that many young players into a team together. You would you would kind of put one or two and, and start to give them those experiences sporadically rather than than throw them in and, and leave them in. So uh, the, the, they are, you know, doing really well considering that. I think what we've already spoke about, what they need is support. They need a lot of support at this moment in time to, to help them through those experiences because they've took a few hits now that, you know, the more hits you take, if you're not getting that support psychologically, it can it can be damaging. So they, they need a lot of support. They, they need a lot of guidance on, on the training pitch. Uh, they need to understand that, that that's part of football, making mistakes. You know, the story I've just told is, is part of football. It, it makes you a stronger person coming through, missing a penalty in a semi-final a cup or making a mistake for a goal makes you a stronger person and the players need support and understanding on, on how to deal with that, how to work on the training pitch to, to make that better and ultimately improve performances and results. And that is the, the life of a football player. And, and these young boys need, need support to, to help them do that. I think that's a really good point. And I think everyone has seen Amika Obi in his debut at Sitswich. He, he made a couple of mistakes, but since he returned after that game, he's looked so much better. He's looked so much more in, in confidence. So it just shows that if you make a mistake, you can always learn from it and use it as a positive experience. And to keep on the subject with the uh, current squad, uh, Dan G would like to ask, what do you think of the development of Callum Lang? He seems to improve in every game uh, at Motherwell and uh, making the decision to loan him out uh, seems a bit suspect uh, in a way when the club is struggling for players at the moment. Suspect, that's a good word for that. <laughs> uh, I, I coached Callum Lang when he was uh, 15. Uh, we used to, uh, I first started coaching him at, uh, what's the college called? Uh, the college as you're driving out of Wigan that the kids used to train at, I forget what it was called. Uh, I first started coaching him there with Tim Lees and then we, we went to, uh, Robin Park at the the Astros turf behind there and coached him and he was always the, the best player in, in his age group uh, when I then became manager he was in the under 18s and he, he always had a bit of a bit of arrogance a bit of that you know self-belief that you need to be a football player and his development for me has been really good and he really should be at Wigan uh, scoring the goals that he's scoring at Motherwell because uh, he's, he's a a top talent, that another top talent of, of the many ones that the, the academy's produced. Uh, and he's somebody that I think will go on to have a great career for Wigan. I can't wait to see him back in a Wigan shirt. And to link on to the current squad as well, Ian Trencher would like to ask, what would be your long-term strategy for Wigan Athletic as a club to now bounce, bounce back from the situation? <laughs> to bounce back to the situation, I think first and foremost, you need to, to, to try and get a team on the pitch that, that is winning winning games of football and, and ultimately fighting for their life in this league, the, the position they find themselves in now. Uh, so short term, it's about reinstilling confidence in the players, giving them belief uh, to, to go and win games of football. I think longer term, the club has to become self-sustainable. By that, it is developing football players that will ultimately leave the club at some point that reinvests it back into the football club so to go back to my first spell that was you know myself and David Sharp were that was our big kind of blueprint was signing younger players I know we signed Dave Perkins but he was specific to to what we needed within the change room in terms of the characters uh, but if you look at Dan Byrne you look at Max Power Will Grigg Michael Jacobs they were all under 25 and we, that was our big recruitment policy, was signing younger players who we felt we could improve and make better to, to ultimately one day sell on and reinvest that back into the football club, back into the academy uh, and generate funds that way. And I think that has to be the model uh, for, for Wigan Athletic moving forward. I think that's a really good plan, good plan and some great, great points. And uh, to link to the current squad, uh, Pete, Peter Millwood asked, how many of the current 15 squad did you work with when there was a kids or younger players? I don't like the term kids. 
kids no they weren't kids uh i'm not 100 i think it will be maybe three or four uh, like you said chris mary uh callum lang were, were the ones that were, were in that main group that i worked with and a couple others were c- coming into the the kind of academy just just as i was in fact the, i remember the last week i had at, at the football club as the manager we had with the first team we had uh, Jensen Weir, uh, Joffe, uh, and two other players I, I can't remember. But we had four academy players who I'd, I don't know what age they'd been then. They were very young, uh, but we, I spoke to Gregor and they were doing really well, and we felt it would be a good opportunity. And they came and trained with the first team uh, during during the week and. Uh, uh, it was, it's it's great to see their progress when when they got into the, the Wigan Athletic first team and obviously tragic how how they had to leave before re- really fulfilling that potential at Wigan uh, before moving on. It was a real shame and, and Joffy's doing really really well at Leeds and so is Jensen Weir at Brighton and to link back to a question on your career career now sorry about that uh, Andy Gill asked. If you can relive one moment of your career as a player or manager, what would it be? Uh, one moment. Great question from Andy Gill. I'd probably be Blackpool again uh, when we won 4-0 and, and ultimately won the league. We went three points clear. We, I don't know, we were about 17 goals ahead. Uh Obviously, didn't get confirmed till the following week, but uh, that afternoon in Blackpool, not the first half, mind, uh, because the performance was awful and you oh. kept, kept us in the game first half. But second half, I brought Yannick on near the end of the first half, and second half, we, we were outstanding, 1 4 0, uh, and just celebrating with the fans over at that far side at Blackpool. I've had many a great day at Blackpool. I remember the the three 0 game, uh, the three one. Sorry, when when we in the Premier League and, and the full stand was full of Wigan fans, and uh, so that day when we when we won four 0 to to ultimately win the league was was special. From that League One campaign, what was probably the standout game for you outside of the Blackpool game and the Walsall game? Because it was a great season with a lot of high points, a few low points as well, but. I think that year for Wigan fans was kind of the year we almost got the passion back for the club because uh, in many ways it was we had a couple of disappointing years in the championship but the feel good factor was back in League One we won the, the league title Pippin Burton at, in the final day and it was just a great year to be a Wigan fan. It was it was it was a challenging start to the season because we had had so many new players uh, we had to integrate those players we had to. You know, find a system that suited the players. We had to uh, create the team spirit and get the players to to kind of bond and come together. And that takes a bit of time. That was we always knew that was going to be a challenge at the start of the season. Uh, the the two games for me that stand out are Barnsley away, where we were we lost at home to Blackpool and we lost at home to Burton Albion. Uh, two one nil games, and we were under pressure. We were about seventh in the league, sixth in the league, I think, so maybe even worse than that. And we deliberated all week on, or or early part of the week on on how we were going to play. We were still trying to find how to get the best out of Will Grigg, uh, and we were working on on how we supply him with the opportunities to to score goals or to get him the best opportunities to score and we we done something in training that we basically we found Andy Keller as as this kind of inside forward that that could cause a lot of problems with his with his skill with his quickness of feet uh, and so we we came up with a, a system where we played three at the back four midfielders and two wing uh, two midfielders two wing backs and then like two number 10s behind Will Grigg. So no partner alongside Will Grigg, which allowed him. He was never great playing with a partner because he, he almost kind of got in his way. And we always felt he'd be good with a big physical partner to take the burden, the physical burden off him. But then when we came up with the two in behind Will, 
we found a system that that could supply him goals. And that day we were we were outstanding. That day, Andy Kell had scored a brilliant goal uh, that that I, uh, that I still have and and used to to show you know how we wanted to play the game. Uh, but that was a massive turning point winning that day uh, to to give us that confidence. I think we went in a twenty two un- game unbeaten run after that. Uh, that was huge. The other big game I'd say was Gillingham at home, where we were two 0 down, and and the team that year, the the amount of late goals they scored, showed you know how good a team they were, how good characters we had in the team, and and that day they came back and Craig Morgan scored a fantastic header in the 96 minute against a, a team that was was up there challenging for the league as well, and that was another massive point. So they're the two big games that. That would just say had a, a a big impact on that season. There was two really memorable games there, and another question from one of the fans now. James has asked, which is probably going to be quite a, a common question, is why did you send out Sam Morsey on loan to Barnsley? <laughs> That's, this, this is these are the kind of questions that I always say. I'd love to when, when you're a manager of a club, it'd be great to just say exactly, you know. What, what is happening but sometimes you can't because protecting people the player blah 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 but I actually spoke to Sam uh, recently about the club and, and when he went to Middlesbrough and have, have no you know hard feelings with Sam we got an offer from Scunthorpe uh, which was more than double what we paid for Sam Morsey and I go back to this recruitment policy of you know, generating funds for the, for the football club that then you reinvest and uh, we got a, a really good offer from them that I, I felt we could, you know, cope with with losing them. The, the, the club were, were happy financially with, with the money that was coming in. So we gave them the opportunity to go and speak to Scunthorpe. Sam then ultimately didn't want to go. But then obviously when you've kind of said when the club has gave him that opportunity to go, he then thinks that the club don't want me and it's difficult to then reintegrate him back into the team and other teams become aware that he might be available. So other teams come and ask. And we actually got a six-month loan fee. It was six months he went on loan. A six-month loan fee that was not far short of the actual fee we had paid for Sam Morsey. So again, financially, we basically loaned the player out that repaid the money that we paid for him and and he, he was still coming back to the club so again financially it, it made sense for for the football club so at the time as a manager you, you you can't say that information but uh the, there was no real hard feeling between me and sam and it was it was football and, and these things happen in football ultimately sam went away came back and and he was a better player when he came back in my opinion because he, he, he came back with a real point to prove and, and went on to be a fantastic player for Wigan Athletic. And I'm delighted he he, he done that uh, because when I signed him, I, I knew he had that potential to, to be a great player for the football club. Sammy's held in really high regard now. He's probably classed as a club legend along with the likes of Emerson Boyce. And uh, the next question I'd like to ask is uh, from Conor Donnelly. Uh, and he asked, who would you say has been your favourite manager you have worked under? Uh, my, my, I've got two really, or three actually. For, for Scotland, Walter Smith was was a brilliant manager, uh, t- tactically, defensively, like so organised, uh, put up some great uh, defensive kind of rear guard actions against some some great international teams, and was a was a brilliant man manager as well. Uh, and the two club managers were Gordon Strachan and, and Roberto for, for different reasons. Gordon was somebody that I, I was about 24 when I went to Celtic and he took my game to another level, took my fitness to another level, put demands on me that no other manager had ever done and uh, really kind of pushed me to, to be the, the best player I could possibly be. And, and for that, I'll always be thankful. And again, a brilliant man manager knew how to push my buttons and, and other people's buttons within the, the squad. And then Roberto, I came to Wigan at 28-year-old, uh, had experienced a lot in football, 
and he showed me a different way of playing, a different way of coaching, a different way of, of analysing football matches. And uh, it was just amazing to, to be a part of, of the team and the way he wanted the game to be played. But not only that, I think he probably helped my coaching career uh, and how I kind of seen myself uh coaching and how I wanted to set teams up and how I wanted to, to organise them. He had a massive influence on that as well. Three great managers there and uh, some really great memories for yourself playing with those managers. I'd, I'd like to say a massive thank you uh, for coming on tonight. It's much appreciated. And we got one question coming in as well from uh, Graham Foster. And he said, can you talk us through the process of a new manager coming into a club from a player's point of view? In terms of in terms of like how does the players react to a new person coming into the fold? Uh, again, it's you're, you're, so you're coming into a, a a club for the first time. You have twenty four players. You have staff. Uh, you have supporters, obviously, as well, and and you are trying to make an impact in, in a positive way on on all those different people. But in terms of the players, so. The, the previous manager can only pick 11 players, so of a squad of 20 odd, then it's probably 50 50 or, or at least kind of 70 30. That you know, 30 percent to 50 percent of those players will be delighted the manager's gone because they weren't getting a game under that old manager, and now a new manager's coming in, so they think they can show the new manager that they should be playing. So, those people might be fairly happy that a new manager's coming in. The other players, a lot of them might be really disappointed, really had a good relationship with the old manager. So you have to, again, like we spoke about before, get to know every individual as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, let them know that, that you're there to support them, you're there to help them uh, be the best footballer they can be, and you're there to give them a structure and give them uh, something that's going to help them win football matches and and once you do that and once that starts to gather momentum th then you can start to really put your stamp on a football club but when you, when you first go in the door you have to earn the players respect you have to get to know the players and you have to come up with a game plan that the players understand that is going to help them win football matches quickly uh, and once you do that then you can start to build the football club bit by bit and, and add you the layers to it. But uh, in the beginning, it's it's all about personal relationships. That's a great answer. And I'd like to say a massive thanks to Queen on tonight. It's much appreciated. I'm sure the fans really appreciate hearing from you. It's been great to listen to some of your stories. And I'd like to now ask, what would be your message to the athletic supporters? It would be keep doing what you've always done and, and support the football club. And and I, I say to players a lot, con control the controllables. And, and as Wigan fans, you can only control your love for the football club whenever you get the opportunity to go back to the stadium, go back and support the players as, as much as you can. What is happening at, at boardroom level and ownership level, you can't control. So, so don't get fixated or, or frustrated by that. Uh, control what you can by by your support to the team, uh, and and give that. And and if you do that, then then that's all you can do, and the, the players will appreciate that. I think that's a great saying, and I'd also like to say it, it's been great to to have you on in terms of the mental health group too, because it's been great to see so many familiar faces tonight, because so many people in this group have been absolutely sensational in supporting the mental health group, and this is the first ever virtual night, and and you've been a great guest and. One one final question, which was from Ian Trenchard. I can't leave this out. Uh, and he said, do you have any thoughts on what football needs to do to survive and thrive uh, after the coronavirus pandemic? That is a good question. Uh, I, th I think we all have to stick together a bit. I think, especially early with the Premier League, and, and I didn't like the the bigger clubs and the, the greed uh that has been in football for a long time, if we're being honest, uh, and, and the greed that, that that opportunity they felt they could take at this time. I think football has to help each other, uh, and the bigger clubs should look after the, the pyramid uh, system in England and help the lower clubs so that everyone after this pan pandemic can, can, can still be here and, and still survive and, 
you know, every town and, and city across, you know, the UK, the, the people of that town can, can go and support their local football club and, and that football club will still be there. And that has to come from the top. They have to support that and they have to get behind that. But the greed and uh, the, the finances that are in football sometimes doesn't allow for that. And hopefully, uh, as this goes on, I think i seen something recently about some money uh, dropping into League 2 and possibly League 1 uh, fr from the, the Premiership. And hopefully that, that happens and, and every club can survive this and we can get back to normality. And the biggest thing for me is supporters back in the stadium. The, the quicker that happens, whether it's 100 or 1,000, whatever it is, get as many fans as we possibly can back into stadiums and then when that you know can grow and into full stadiums again then the quicker that happens the better because ultimately w without supporters then football as we've seen recently isn't actually you know as good uh, as it can be because supporters are so important to the game. Football is absolutely nothing about fans and I'd like to personally take time to shout out every fan who came into this chat tonight and, and speak to Gary and obviously listen to his stories. Uh, this is the first time I've ever hosted anything, so my host skills will get better as the uh, virtual nights go on. But I'd like to thank Johnny Green, Ian Trencher, Phil Stewart, Barry Goodwin, my dad, Peter Millwood, Mark Hayes, Adam Brooks, Connor Donnelly, James, Zan McCormall, uh, that's probably an iPad, that's probably, not his, that's probably not his real name, Andy Gill, Sam Remington, Dan G and uh, the mystery iPhone who's uh, been watching. It's been great to hear your stories and uh, it's been great to listen to you. On a final note now, uh, the final question would be, on a mental health point of view, what would be your advice uh, to anyone who is thinking about opening up and uh, reaching out? Uh, speak to people, speak to someone you trust, speak to someone who can, who can help you. Uh, there's, there's no shame in it. Uh, it's, it's something, like I said, everyone at some point in their life goes through some sort of problem uh, and, and it's always better to, to have other people to help you. I've always, you know, my whole life has been in a team environment and, and that uh, spirit and that togetherness of having other people uh, to help you in, the, in your difficult moments is, is, is vital. Uh, so speak to people as much as you can. and, and you know, get in a routine as much as you can. Uh, try and set yourself little goals every day uh, that stop you from, from kind of drifting into uh, difficult times. Uh, I think it's important as well, especially when we've got so much time in our hands. You've got to try and use that time wisely. Uh, but if you are, you know, feeling anything, then it's so important you speak to someone. I absolutely agree. And I'd also like to say, if you have any concerns or want someone to speak to in a safe space, you can contact any of us at the Wigan Athletic Mental Health Group, either on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email, you name it, and we'll uh, happily chat to you. So it's been a great night tonight. Thank you all for joining. We're unfortunately at the end of the evening. Gary, thanks so much for joining and uh, thanks to everyone else for joining too. Unfortunately, the minute countdown's on, so we'll have to say our goodbyes, but this has been the first ever Wigan Athletic Supports Club Mental Health uh, meet up and hopefully it's the first of many. Good night. Thanks, Gary. All the best. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Jay. You're welcome. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good night. Thanks, guys. Take care, everyone. Peace.